Okay, that, that's the time to start. So I'm going to start. Um, Daniel told me that I can't actually speak too quickly. So if I speak too quickly, it's, it's his fault. Um, in 1963, JFK made what was the, the first transatlantic phone call via a, a, a geostationary satellite uh, to another world leader. Um, he spoke from Washington, D.C. Uh, through a satellite called Syncom 2 to the Prime Minister of Nigeria, who was aboard the USNS Kingsport, which was stationed just off Lagos. This is the, the first time the two world leaders had spoken via satellite, but it was also a big turning point in the ability for us to uh, expand communications on, on Earth. In the 60s, the, the number of sort of transatlantic telephone lines available ranged at about the hundreds. So there was a very limited resource. And by flying with satellite, we managed to demonstrate that with like a mediocre, like a, like a medium sort of investment that we could increase uh, communication across the planet without having to deploy tons of infrastructure. So using the satellite was a big alternative to deploying loads of transatlantic cable. Syncom 2 was uh, a, a spinning sphere covered in a spinning cylinder covered in uh, solar panels um, is the, the second of three Syncom satellites that was put into a, a geostationary orbit. This orbit is at an altitude that allows the, the satellite to be continuously in view. Um, so uh, a geostationary orbit is an orbit uh, which is a, a high enough altitude that from a position on Earth, an observer sees the, the orbiter as, as stationary. This orbit is created by putting yourself into an altitude uh, above uh, this is achieved by putting the, the satellite into an orbit above um, Earth so that it orbits Earth once per uh, Earth day. So the orbit is synchronized to, to that of Earth. Um, this is uh, in comparison to uh, LEO and MEO orbits. So a LEO orbit is a low Earth orbit. It's an orbit very close to the plane of Earth. And a MEO orbit is sort of everything in between. For LEO and MEO orbits, the orbit can't synchronize with uh, the orbit of Earth. And so to an observer on the planet, the satellite will move across the sky. For a LEO orbit, the satellite will move across the sky quite quickly. This means that for a portion of the, the satellite's orbit, the satellite is actually in the shadow of Earth and you can't speak to it. And so to build up a complete communications network, you need to have multiple satellites flying. Because the satellites are moving across your perspective, you also have to track them to, to have good communications with them, to have a strong signal to get your link back. And this normally requires mechanical means. So you get um, tracking satellite arrays and, and you have to have mechanisms to follow this through the sky. Sort of things that are in LEO are the, the ISS, Hubble, Starlink now, um, and Iridium. In MEO, we have uh, GPS and O3B. Um, but the majority of VSAT communications until sort of last year has all been um, stuff in geo. Because you can just point your dish at something stationary in the sky, it makes it very easy to, to set up a, a ground station and, and have something to speak to. Uh, satellites today are a bit different. And so this is Hylus 1. Hylus 1 is uh, parked over uh, Northern Europe and North Africa. It has a nice big beam that covers uh, Northern Europe. Uh, and also has a steerable beam section, which can be repositioned based on customer demand. Um, one of these is, uh, I think, three to four hundred million dollars to fly. So they're they're very expensive. They cost a lot of money to put into space, um, but they're they're quite good. So my name is uh, Tom Jones. I'm a, a researcher at the University of Aberdeen. I do internet engineering. Uh, I work on uh, internet and transport protocol design and implementation. And as part of that, I write standards in the ITF. I'm to blame for uh, RFC 8304 and RFC 8899 stuff about UDP. Uh, I like to, to hack on FreeBSD and I, I use FreeBSD quite a lot as the implementation part of the IETF process because running code is, is good code. Really, I like to try and make the internet better. Uh, I like to say I'm one eighth of, of the BSD Now hosting team or I have been since the start of this, uh, since the middle of this year. Um, for the last few years, I've been working with a European Space Agency funded project to make sure that Quick works well in satellite environments. I have some IETF work in progress right now that could really need they do with some input and the ITF is a bit like an open source project and we'll solicit uh, feedback from anywhere. And so the top one here, Draft Jones Transport for Satellite is a document which is trying to describe the properties of satellite networks. So transport protocol designers can build test beds and harnesses and understand what's going on. And we're almost completely lacking information on LEO and MEO systems because on one hand, they don't really fly and there's not a lot of service there. On the other hand, no one will let us play with them. So if you have these and want to let me play with it, that'd be cool. But if not, I'd love to, um, take some text either on or off the record and we can figure out how to make these, these protocols uh, more open to other people.
This talk is uh, an introduction to using DummyNet to build uh, networks for experimentation. It's really wrapped in the state of the art of transport protocol design. And I'm just going to get a bit lost into internet engineering because I like internet engineering. So transport protocols are the protocols that we use to move stuff around on the internet. Uh, they layer on top of IP. Famous transport protocols are uh, TCP, UDP, and SCTP. Uh, and they're used to move things around. So they, they offer services on top of the bare bones mechanism, which is IP, which just connects hosts together and does routing. Uh, the web runs on top of HTTP. HTTP has seen a lot of uh, evolution in the last uh, 30 years since its inception. And it has grown from uh, a protocol designed for dealing with very simple web pages, which are basically like a, what would go in an academic paper with maybe a couple of images to what we now deliver. Um, I mean, full fledged uh, interactive web applications where you can do streaming video and stuff because I've got I've got it over here. Um, HTTP has grown to Im improve performance in a lot of ways. So the web pages that we have today um, now typically have sort of 200 or so objects on them. So they are packed with a lot of stuff. Uh, HTTP was designed for a page with maybe one two other external resources being pulled onto it. And so HTTP had some scaling issues. To work around some scaling problems, HTTP introduced um, multiple parallel connections. And so what you would end up with the web browser performing six HTTP connections to each server described by the page, which encouraged people to distribute stuff over big CDNs. Uh, and this allowed you to speed up page performance. For a long time, Google has been working on an internal project to improve web performance and reduce web latency. In 2012, we saw the first sort of major hints of this with the release of a protocol called Speedy. Speedy was uh, adopted by the IETF and Speedy evolved into what is called HTTP2. HTTP2 tried to address some of uh, the HTTP1 series issues with performance by evolving the protocol a bit. One thing was to get rid of the TCP setup latency that impacted HTTP, H2 offers something called multi-streaming. So virtually on top of your HTTP tunnel, you're able to create multiple GET requests and have multiple channels coming through. Um, coupled with TCP Fast Open, it was able to get zero RTT connection set up for subsequent connections. Uh, it added flow control, and flow control is very important because after you've asked for 100 resources, it's up to the client to then schedule when what is coming. Um, and this is a really difficult problem actually to deal with. Uh, it was found that when HTTP2 helped, it helped quite a lot, but when it didn't help, it actually hurt. And so it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a massive benefit in, in all directions for, for coming through. Basically, all web traffic ever so far has been HTTP over TCP, though it's, it is changing. So to, to speed up TCP, we work on the problem of dealing with the, the TCP uh, handshake. Um, and so a typical uh, HTTP session will look like this from the TCP perspective. TCP has what's called a three-way handshake. So uh, the initiator, I'm going to call the client from now on, the client sends a hello message to the server, which is a SYN. The server respond, responds with the SYN ACK. And finally, the, the client will ACK this packet. And after this ACK, the third message in our three-way handshake, we have a connection. After the, the ACK has been sent, the client can then send data. And so the soonest the server can have access to any date, any request from the server, uh, from the client, is at one and a half RTTs. So, um, one one and a half steps through here and so the idea with using multiple http connections is if you're doing uh, serialized requests for resources on a page you're doing this process at the start of every connection and this process takes time and if you're doing a lot of these it will take a lot of time and they build on top of each other and so instead run these in parallel you get more throughput and you're better able to use your link because you're not spending a lot of time just waiting for tcp handshakes to happen Things in GeoOrbit are really far away. To get to a position where you are synchronized with Earth's orbit, you need to be 36,000 kilometers uh, from the surface of the Earth. Uh, at the speed of light, if you're directly below, then it takes about 240 milliseconds for a signal to go from Earth to the satellite. So this is very far away. Uh, and annoyingly, the speed of light is fixed and we can't speed it up. Um, actually, most things speaking to Geo are not perfectly below the, the satellite they're speaking to, and they're actually at an angle. And we more see a propagation delay of around 280 milliseconds. Um, this means that we get 200, takes 280 milliseconds for a signal to go from me to the satellite to Earth, um, which is the one-way satellite delay. 
So we get a uh, round trip time or uh, the time it takes for a message to go from one side and to come back. Uh, it sits around 560 milliseconds. Actually, in reality, we see that we get a lot more latency added and the ground station needs to speak to the internet. And so delays can typically range up to about 650 milliseconds. The delay hurts a lot. Anything that is going to work from the round trip time, anything that is interactive is going to be influenced heavily by the delay. Uh, to give you sort of scale, my delay to internet from here is about 30 milliseconds. So you're talking like 20 times as long for any of these connections. Lots of things we build the internet with, um, so lots of the congestion control and recovery mechanisms we have and buffer tuning we have are, are grow as a function of the RTT. And this is okay when the RTT is small, um, but it, it gets very big on a satellite network and things just get confused and Reno, raw, normal TCP Reno and satellite is very unenjoyable experience to use. We could talk about satellite networks a bit. And so a satellite network sort of looks like this. Um, we have uh, on the left of the image, we have uh, a client device, which, you know, a nice little desktop PC. And the client device is connected to uh, a satellite terminal and the terminal is connected to a satellite dish. And the satellite dish has a radio transmitter on it. I'm going to call it LNB today. Um, on the, on the there is a device which handles all of the modem stuff for speaking to the satellite. The satellite will then communicate to a ground station. These are normally um, a centralized site. There might be a few footprint of the satellite that act as a centralized site. And then the centralized site will then speak out to the internet. We can speed up the, the performance of TCP and satellites and satellite networks by using something like performance enhancing proxy. The performance enhancing proxy uh, acts as a middleman in the way of the communications from the client to the server, and it does stuff to make the connection better. Um, what we commonly come across are called split TCP PEPs. And so at the, the satellite terminal on the client side and the ground station on the server side, TCP connections are terminated. So the devices there basically insert themselves in the way of the, tr in the, way of the connection and they say, oh, you're, you're speaking to me. This means that the client device speaking to the PEP has a very low RTT. And actually the, the PEP is normally running on the modem, which is just like one hop away from the, the wireless route you're gonna to speak to. And so you get RTTs of about a millisecond when you speak to the PEP. Um, and equally on the other side, the server speaking to the satellite customer uh, might not know it's there. It's actually gonna see sort of a normal internet scaled away. And so end to end on this path, the TCP connections that we know of, the server and the client, don't really know they're speaking over satellite. The PEP works by capturing traffic from the, the the client and intercepting it. And so in the diagram, the handshake we have for TCP, the SYNAC we get actually just comes from the PEP and it gets terminated. Um, it, it gets intercepted. Uh, and with a HTTP request, this means that the client will make the request before anything has had time to propagate over the satellite link. Um, equally, when we send the SYN through, the protocol that runs between the terminal and the ground station, which is proprietary and have no view of, uh, will, will generate resource requests and start setting up to handle a, a TCP connection for us. And it might even lead to the generation of a SYN before we've made any further requests. Um, data that will then transmit over the satellite link and it will get to the, the ground station's PEP and then it will make a normal internet connection. Using a, a performance enhancing proxy like this, we're actually able to get um, packets at the client back from the server in around one RTT, so around 600 milliseconds, uh, whereas normally it would have taken uh, 900 milliseconds if we didn't have the PEP in the way before the server sent any traffic. And so there's a big uh, performance improvement here and a big reduction in latency for things that PEP can predict for us. Quick is uh, a next generation transport protocol, which is being published by the ITF. It's published across four RFCs this year. Quick came from further efforts in Google to improve web performance. Um, it's published over four RFCs. The main Quick RFC is RFC 9000. It's a giant document that's worth reading if you want to learn about Quick, I guess. Um, and then it's accompanied with three other documents. It's accompanied with something called the Invariance, which is RFC 8999. Uh, the Invariance are basically everything in Quick, uh, which is in the clear on the wire, uh, which is very little. There's a, a TLS mapping document called RFC 9001 and a congestion control and recovery document called RFC 9002. Uh, the quick working group is not done. The quick working group is gonna continue to 
uh, standardize extensions to Quick. In the progress right now, there is a datagram extension to do unreliable transport over Quick, something called Mask, um, which allows you to do proxying. It is also the core technology behind Apple's uh, privacy VPN they've rolled out this year. Uh, and the Quick Working Group is going to do what they've called a fast process to Quick V2. They're not going to hang around. They're going to let the protocol evolve uh, as it needs to. Quick runs on top of UDP. It uses UDP as a substrate. And so it uses UDP for port numbers, but, but that's basically it. Uh, it is a, a multi-streaming protocol with a lot of flexibility in it. It was before uh, reliable and ordered by stream. It was originally designed to carry HTTP3, but now is actually being put to a lot of use cases. The transport protocol itself is fully authenticated and encrypted on the wire. There's almost nothing visible uh, as an outsider. It has support for zero RTT connection resumption, has support for connection uh, migration and load balancing. And so it is designed for the way we use the web today. Uh, and it has mechanisms that allow more modern congestion control and loss recovery. Um, and these basically have made, taken a clean slate approach to what was in TCP. It's been designed deliberately to resist ossification. So if you think about the TCP PEP before, uh, the TCP PEP that was terminating our TCP connection so it could make its own special one, it has to understand and speak TCP and be able to be involved in the communication. Um, if the PEP is not upgraded to understand new TCP developments, then these things just don't work. And so there was a lot of trouble deploying TCP fast open because the network had ossified around TCP. Quick has been deliberately designed to avoid ossification. And part of that is the authentication and encryption. Another part is that all basically all the protocol fields in Quick um, that could be left as a don't care can be greased. Grease mean, greasing means just sticking random numbers in there. And so it's designed to be hard to fingerprint Quick and figure out what is in there. There are a ton of Quick implementations there. Uh, all of them are in user in user space apart from one, which also runs in the kernel. Uh, Quick did a great public interrupt process uh, based on Docker, where they ran uh, public test suites of all the implementations against each other. And you can look this up. It's still online. It's still being used. Um, and there's a lot available. As you as a network operator, it means you're going to see a lot more UDP traffic. I imagine, actually, if you're paying attention, you've seen a big spike in UDP traffic towards Google resources and towards Facebook. Um, your metadata is basically gone. There is something called a spin bit available in Quick, so you can measure RTT of connections, but it has to be used by both sides of the connection, so you might not see it work. Interception boxes are dead. Any uh, MSS rewriting boxes or HTTP proxies or PEPs aren't going to work anymore. You're going to see less of your network, and you're just going to have to accept the reality. I don't think you can have an argument with this one. I think you're just going to have to accept that traffic is becoming encrypted. OK, so why am I looking at Quick and satellites? In 2019 and, and before, as this protocol was being developed, there was uh, a, a serious concern that uh, Quick was not going to work well in satellites. The perception is that TCP without a PEP on a geolink is, is not, not a good idea. And it's, it's not great. I mean, it's very unenjoyable. You can go and set up one later with the stuff in the talk, and you can see that it's quite hard. Um, but the view was the connections without a PEP were just completely untenable and unusable. Um, because Quick can't be accelerated because it is encrypted, um, they basically thought this was the end of the road for Geo. And because these are $400 million projects, uh, they were a bit worried that their investment was gone. DNS acceleration is still possible for now until we see DOE do deployment. But yeah, there's a big concern about the future of Geo. So at the University of Aberdeen, we've had um, satellite test beds for developing uh, internet protocols since the 80s. Um, over in the sort of middle left of the picture, just above the dome, there is uh, our old satellite test bed, which is a, a fallen dying pile of, of satellite dishes. Um, somebody helpfully built a library in the way, so they, they no longer had a view to the sky anyway. Um, and on the right, we have the modern um, visa infrastructure that we have. We have two links from uh, Avanti. Um, these look basically identical to satellite TV dishes. They are a bit larger. And the main difference is they have a massive LNB on the front so they can so they can speak back. We have what is called a 10.2 service from Avanti. It's a geo service, so it has all the problems uh, built into there. They kindly given us an engineering link. We don't know what this means. Uh, in reality, we get something like uh, 8.5 megabit down, 1.5 megabit up. We typically see around 600 milliseconds of delay and then internet delay. And so we can maybe hit Google in about 620, 610 milliseconds. There's a big variance in delay. It's not uncommon to see spikes up to eight seconds. Um, 
and, and so it's hard to use. We have uh, a, a limited uh, SLA. So we have uh, a, a limited scale in our agreement. We don't know what the limit is. Um, at some point, if we move too much traffic, the internet will stop. So we, we can't just run constant back-to-back -back file transfer experiments because we will run out of our, our resource for science. So to work around this, we need to use emulation. Um, emulation allows us to model networks that we don't have access to, but also allows us to model networks that we can't really abuse. Uh, for network emulation, we found that dummy net on FreeBSD is the best choice. We did look at using um, QDiscs and TC and all of Linux's net and infrastructure, but we found that it was very difficult to design a link that would give you the performance characteristic you actually require. And so you could design a link that would um, give you the, the delay you've configured or the bandwidth you've configured, but it was applied statistically, which meant that the average would hit these limits. And sometimes you get packets going through too fast. And that wasn't really acceptable for the sort of test we were going to do. So to do network emulation, we use DummyNet. Dominet is a, a traffic shaper, bandwidth manager, and delay emulator. Uh, the traffic shaping means that it can uh, consume and balance the traffic among multiple applications, which is not something I'm going to touch on today. Bandwidth management means that it is able to uh, enforce bandwidth limits and control the rates that uh, um, applications can send at. Uh, delay emulator means that we're able to emulate different lengths of networks. So we're able to emulate networks um, from local host all the way out to to the moon. Um, I, I like to think about delay lines and mercury delay lines as a thing that existed before, and they're great to look up. Uh, Dominat has been in FreeBSD for a long time. I think it was originally proposed in a 1997 paper by Luigi Rizzo, but it's seen a, a ton of evolution and improvement since then. Uh, just a short list of features are added to it, bridging support. It was integrated to IPFW since it was first proposed. It grew packet scheduling and AQM algorithms in a, in a really nice way that makes them quite pluggable. Uh, it is the first place the SCTP NAT was implemented, as far as I understand. And it has Mac layer emulation. It's sort of a great thing. Uh, DummyNet needs to interfa interface with a packet classifier. So DummyNet doesn't have any idea really about uh, how packets are specified and moved around. It's grown this, but it didn't originally. So it needed to integrate with a packet classifier. Um, a packet classifier is also a firewall. And so DummyNet integrates really well with IPFW. There are two interfaces into IPFW, uh, two interfaces into DummyNet from IPFW. There are pipes, which I use to emulate links. And there are queues, which are used for doing um, traffic shaping and scheduling. When we want to feed traffic into DummyNet, we just need to add a rule in IPFW and the packet will get given to DummyNet. And then at some point later, the packet will pop out or it won't, or it might just pop out immediately. Uh, and it is very, very straightforward. There's very little DummyNet in this talk. Um, my first dummy net example was the one from the dummy net website, uh, and it's the first one I did. And so this allows you to simulate an ADSL link to the moon. Uh, so you add to IPFW uh, a pipe for your incoming traffic and a pipe for your outgoing traffic. And then you configure the, the four main parameters on the pipe. So you configure the bandwidth, the amount of buffering, and the delay. And there is also a packet loss rate, which is available for, for pipes, which is left here. Anything you configure with an IPFW command, um, will be set and the defaults will be left for any of the fields you don't specify. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a minefield that you can hit. Before we can talk about emulating our network, we need to figure out what the network is and what parts of the network we care about. And there are four main properties that we like to talk about when we're, when we're, we're talking about what the network is made of. Um, there is the delay, which is the time it takes for a signal to propagate through the network. Um, so how long it takes for a packet I send to get from me to the server I'm speaking to. The bandwidth, which is the number of bits per second the network can uh, process. Buffering, which is the ability, the network's ability to accommodate bursts of traffic, or its ability to accommodate when it has too much. Buffering is very important. Too little buffering and, and performance suffers and throughput drops, and too much buffering and, and latency suffers. So it's a very difficult thing to tune. There's also um, packet loss. Um, packets are dropped all the time. IP is a, a best effort transport medium, so it doesn't do anything to try and try and um, make sure packets get there. Um, on a satellite link, there's no packet loss on the satellite side, but there is packet loss on other parts of the network. Uh, so we want to characterize our network before we try and build any emulation of the network. And so we need to run measurements. And so here's some quick rules for making sensible measurements. You need to take uh, multiple measurements and you need to apply 
um, common sense to the measurements you take. You need to work from an average, really. You need to understand what the network can do. Before you look at any new protocol, uh, you definitely need to set up a baseline to make sure your network is configured properly. And it's likely that your, your environment will have its own peculiarities. You need to test your measurements against your intuition and the understanding of the design and the configurations limitations. So you need to be very careful of the measurements you get that you're actually measuring something. If you run an iPerf and you get 11 gigabit a second on your home DSL, you're probably just measuring against localhost. And equally, if your ping is 28 milliseconds, then I am sure you're not using the satellite link. And every time I use the satellite link, I test to make sure the RTT is correct. If everything matches your expectations, then also be suspicious because the computers are, are definitely plotting against you. The, the main characteristic that we talk about when we talk about satellite networks is delay. Uh, we measure delay in seconds. We normally talk about delay in milliseconds, which is a thousandth of a second. It's precise enough uh, without being silly. Data centers will see lower delays than this. Um, I measure delay using ping. Ping is one of my favorite hacks in computer networking. Um, a delay will have a big impact on anything that needs to feel interactive. A delay variation will have a big impact on anything that needs to feel interactive because it makes it hard to predict. So if you have constant delay, you can actually start working over it. Uh, a great test is to just try using SSH over 4G and then start a download and you'll see your delay go a bit wild and it'll be really, really unpleasant. When we're taking delay, we need to get a reasonable number of samples so we can get a min max and average and a, a picture of what the delay variation is. Um, and delay will vary based on tons of things. So it can vary by packet scheduling and hardware and link layer losses. Um, networks like Wi-Fi will retransmit for you. Um, so you won't actually see a loss, but you will see a, a change in delay. Uh, we find that the real satellite networks we use have a diurnal pattern of, of use. And so to get a real picture of what is going on, we ran a ping every second for a week and we figured out where evening was and what the, the variance in different times of day were. And we could, we could actually pop this out in the, the delay variance. So if you want to run a single test, you can just ping uh, eurobsdcon.org. Uh, I did this from home where I'm not right now. Um, you'll see the third packet here. The delay is... Um, uh, 115 milliseconds, that means that something happened inside the Wi-Fi, but you actually see in the summary that there was no packet loss. So something something weird went on. Uh, the characteristic you care more about, because it's probably the one you buy, is bandwidth or capacity. Uh, bandwidth measured in bits, we talk about millions or billions of, of bits, so mega and gigabits. There's loads of tools for measuring uh, capacity. I love iperf 3 it can benchmark TCP, UDP, and SCTP, it can report in JSON, and it can do a single shot server mode, which makes it great for integrating into testing. Um, annoyingly, it, it defaults to measuring from the client to the server. You use iperf 3 like this, so I did a measurement from home. Uh, the dash R at the end there makes the server send to me. It's a secret EuroBSD con iperf server, don't use it. Um, and you can see that it has measured um, my network capacity. Uh, iperf 3 defaults to using TCP, so you can see that TCP will send it at 28 megabits per second. If I measure the normal way, so if I measure from the client to the server, so without the dash R flag, you'll see that my network capacity is, is awful at home, which is why I'm in the local hackerspace and why BSD now won't be getting live streams with me in them for a while, because my network is just not up to it. Um, I pursued those UDP measurements. UDP measurements are a bit different. For iper 3 UDP measurements, iperf will try to send as many packets as it can and just see what happens. Uh, it will default to sending at one megabit per second. So if you run an experiment for this, you'll see that you get 1.05 megabits per second. You'll feel happy. Instead, you need to tell iperf to send with the uh, target bitrate flag. And so I ran a test here. So sending from uh, a client in my house out to the internet, um, I ask iperf to send at 10 megabits per second, and you'll see that we get a report from the client and a report from the server. The report from the client is what it was able to send. If you set this number too high, then iperf3 won't get there. With a single core, it will struggle to do a gigabit per second, so you'll see what it actually sent. And it reports from the server, and these are the packets that actually arrived. And so running with UDP tests, we see that I have 3.39 megabits per second up, which is dreadful. And we see that somewhere 62% of the packets go away. I added the get server output flag here, and so what we can do is we can look at the time intervals for iperf um, and you could look through these and if you see a, a big change in the packet loss percentage you might see that you have competing traffic and that might influence the measurements you're doing the the hardest question you're going to see today is, is how much buffering do i need um, networks need to buffer packets um, buffers are required to make sure that performance is good enough uh, but too much buffering and performance suffers and too little buffering and performance suffers. And yeah, performance can have different meanings here. And so too much buffering 
uh, our latency will get really high because we've got to go through the buffer before we can get through the network. And too little buffering means that uh, the protocols we have just will struggle. And so below, I've just drawn out a quick uh, plot of what uh, Reno looks like. So this is a Reno sawtooth. Um, Reno will glow into, grow until it see losses, and then it will half the size of the sending rate. Um, and so if we grow the congestion window, then we get a loss, we go to 50%. If we do this without any buffering, then we get about a 50% utilization of the link. Um, if we do this with one BDP of buffering, we get closer to 80% utilization of the link. So adding buffering can help. Too much buffering though, when we get buffer blue and everything goes the wrong way again. When we talk about buffering, we talk about the bandwidth delay product. Um, this allows us to size buffers for applications. Um, we get the bandwidth delay product by multiplying the, the bandwidth and the delay. Um, to fill the network, we need to be able to send one BDP of, of data at a time. And the sender and the receiver have to be able to buffer this much. Uh, or the pro reliable protocols we have require the receiver is able to receive this much traffic. The BDP for satellite networks is completely unreasonable. So I used Calc and I made a quick table here. Um, when we were talking about um, doing 50 megabit ex experiments for the transport for a satellite document, uh, I, I did the maths and I found out we need to have a four megabyte uh, window for us to saturate the link at 50 megabit. In comparison, uh, data sent a link uh, around five milliseconds delay. Um, you could do 20 gigabit of traffic with that size of window. And so actually with satellite networks, we're, we're pushing on the, the harder part of the network here. And we need to have really large buffer sizes. Okay, now we can talk about networks. Um, for network experimentation, we have a couple of topologies that we end up with, but the most common one is something called a, a dumbbell network. A uh, dumbbell network sort of looks like this, where we have um, infrastructure at one side, and it speaks through a bottleneck, and the bottleneck is the internet or a router, and then we have stuff come out the other side. Um, we found that for delay emulation, virtual machines just have problems because time in a virtual machine is too weird. Um, and with the virtual machines, we actually see packets coming through uh, faster than they should be able to. Uh, and so you need to use hard devices for this. And so our delay networks are built with physical computers, which means we've got some weirder stuff. Um, the network that we used for doing satellite experiments looks like this. Uh, it was built out of three APU2 boards, uh, all running FreeBSD 12. Um, and they're connected up so that the client connects to the router and then the router connects to the server and then traffic will go over the links. Uh, to make this manageable, we have a head node, which we use to we use as a point to SSH in to control any of the hosts. And these are all connected together through an infrastructure switch. And so the client, router, and server all, all connect to the infrastructure switch, gives us a way to manage experiments without sending traffic on the experimental link. And we all connect it together and it gets a bit like this. Uh, and in reality, it looks like this. And in great COVID uh, science, you get to see our test bed sat on my bed. Um, and it is a nice tidy collection of cables, um, but it, it was what <laughs> was what we had. Um, this network is is very simply put together. The entire config is in these slides. Uh, some of it's hidden for later. The the router is set up so that it acts as the the gateway on the interface connected to the client and the interface connected to the server, um, and it forwards packets. The router's firewall rules look like these, and basically it allows traffic. It, enfor it, it enforces forward direction, uh, delay, and bandwidth on stuff from the client interface, and it enforces return traffic on the server interface. And, and that's all. This is the entire firewall rule. It's very, very simple. It's very easy to inter integrate into a test like this. So the network actually looks like this. So we get our return traffic which is traffic from the client to the server going out over the satellite link. Um, and we can talk about the link and we get the forward link set up like this. And so it's very simple and it's easy to integrate. Uh, because DummyNet is uh, unfriendly to me, um, it clears out all parameters. And so as we ran experiments with other configurations based on scenarios from transport for sat, uh, I ended up writing scripts to configure, uh, to control the reconfiguration of the, of the test bed. And so they look like this. Um, but really, this is all the interface into DummyNet you need. All of the hard work goes into figuring out what the network is, and the DummyNet does quite a good job of, of getting there. Um, so we ran ex experiments for, for satellite links inside this test bed. Um, and while we were 
uh, configuring the test bed, we actually found it very difficult to get TCP up to speed. And so if we take a plot from uh, Wireshark of a TCP connection, I think it's just moving 100 megabytes of data. Um, we see the congestion window looks like this. Now I said before that Reno has a typical sawtooth pattern. This is definitely not that. Instead, what we have is a, a staircase going up. Uh, and if we, if we zoom in, what we actually see is the blue line is the congestion window as estimated by Wireshark. And the green line is the receive window as signaled by the other TCP. Uh, and what we see is a nice staircase in the green line followed by the blue line. And, and what this tells us is that we're receive window limited, um, but the receive window is growing. And so some digging into FreeBSD, uh, and we, we actually found that the receive window in FreeBSD by default is quite small. I mean, for a VSAT network, um, it's quite big for a normal network. Um, it's quite small, um, but it will auto-tune. And so it will automatically grow. And so each one of these steps in the plot is 16K. And you can go and calculate this out and look at it. Each step is 16K. And that was the automatic grow size for the TCP socket buffer. And so we had to do two things to get performance up. We had to uh, configure on the client and the server the, the max socket buffer size, which allowed us to have bigger buffers for the client and the server. And then from iPerf, we needed to configure uh, a window size so that the um, client and server would single, signal a large enough window so that we could actually saturate the connection. Um, and to get dummy net to support the capacities we needed, we need this, this dummy net command here. So with all this work done, we were able to start looking at Quick, and we ran quite a lot of experiments with Quick, and we looked at Quick's uh, performance in comparison to TCP and TCP with a PEP. And then we went on to look at other things with Quick, and there's a large EU report you can try and dig out that we'll talk about all of this. Uh, but a really early discovery we made is that the Quick we were looking at, and so we were looking at Quickly in 2019, which is an implementation for Fastly. Uh, it's had a lot of development since then, so this is not a valid result anymore. Uh, the quick we were looking at was having a lot of trouble saturating the link. And so we made plots of the congestion window in blue and the flight size. So the flight size is how much data you're sending at once. Um, and we found that the congestion window could grow forever, uh, well beyond the, the bottlenecks marked by the uh, teal and purple lines on this plot. Um, but it was entirely governed by something else. And we digged into this and we found that flow control and quick, uh, which is sort of quick's equivalent to doing uh, a receive window, um, was having a lot of trouble with the, the RTT. So flow control and quick is different from TCP. So quick's flow control is credit-based, uh, whereas TCP's is windows-based. So window-based flow control means that the, the sender needs to track the size of its window and not exceed what it's been told it can send. Um, a flow control-based window, a uh, credit-based fl flow control, um, the the receiver sends you credits, and every time you send a packet, you spend credits, and these need to be renewed by the receiver. And what we found uh, was that we were getting flow control credit release uh, three times per RTT, and it was enough to keep us at the the BDP of the network, but it wasn't enough for us to actually have any congestion control happen. And so we worked around this by completely disabling flow control, and we we tried to offer some advice to the designers from here. And so the final plot I have is um, quick in comparison to TCP with TLS, uh, 1.2 and 1.3. So quick is in the middle in orange. Um, it does reasonably well. The TCPs on the left in purple are using the VSAT network with a PEP. And so these are enhanced uh, connections using TCP. And so they're being sped up. And the connections on the right are not using a PEP. And so their traffic is tunneled through OpenVPN. Uh, and we actually found that Quick's doing okay. I don't think there's actually a lot to be worried about. And there's some great opportunities to speed Quick up, but it, it seems to be doing quite well. So doing this, we did hit limitations of dummy net. Um, it's, it's awful that you can't use dummy net in a virtual machine. Um, it would be nice to be able to use dummy net with VNet, but it just wasn't available when we ran these experiments. Dummy net is, is quite old. Um, and a lot of 32-bit counter limits, which are slowing it down. Um, and it would be good to be able to use dummy net above, above four gigabit in the future. Luigi presented in 2016 uh, TLAM, which was a, a, a terabit uh, emulation design, uh, but there's nothing public about it and we've not seen any growth from there. Uh, so who knows what will happen there next. Um, dummy net is not, not frozen though. And so this year, NetGate are putting a lot of money into bringing their changes to dummy net back into FreeBSD. Um, 
And so this year, Christoph Provost landed uh, VNet support for, for DummyNet. This is great because it means that you can now integrate uh, DummyNet into test suites in FreeBSD and other networks. And so you could add it to your own developer's test infrastructure and make them suffer. Um, and there has been PF support for DummyNet for a long time. It's been in macOS for quite a long time and in PF sense, and it's now being ported across. Uh, there are reviews uh, in FreeBSD. There's a link to the main review, so you can go and test this and, and work on it. Um, and we, we think this will hopefully be MFC. I, I mean, I think it'll have to be a big blocker for it not to be MFC. So there will be dummy net support landing. There is a, a work in progress, high performance dummy net rewrite, but it's private. Uh, and so we'll see it if we see it and maybe watch the mailing list to see if it'll come through. Okay, I have now spoken for 40 minutes. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. How does Quick deal with differing MTU? Um, so uh, RC 8899 is datagram packetization layer path MTU discovery. Uh, I can say that because I wrote it. Uh, it is a algorithm for doing detection of path MTU with uh, networks that support ICMP and don't. Quick uh, actually requires that paths be able to support 1200 bytes. And so all the initial handshake packets are padded out to 1200 bytes. And so it actually deals with a lot of the path MTU problems. And then this algorithm we wrote is, is the next step. Um, a lot of work has gone into Quick to make, oh, sorry, the question is, can Quick be misused for DDoS attacks in the same sense of DNS amplification attacks? Short request, large answer. No, no, we don't think so. Um, it's been designed to avoid this. And so part of this is it, it requires that, um, packets before the handshake are padded out to 1200 bytes, which cuts out a venue uh, for amplification. I'm pretty sure servers aren't meant to send more than 1200 bytes in response. They're meant to stick to the maximum size the client is sent. Um, but even if there's an amplification, it's gonna be quite small with the 1200 byte limit. Um, and there's a lot of crypto involved and a lot of authentication for the source. So it should be avoidable. I'm sure there's an amplification attack hidden somewhere, uh, but there's been a lot of work to avoid this. There's been a lot of thought put into quick to make sure it's uh, safe. Can physical networks be replaced with jails and vImage? Uh, yeah, uh, for a lot of cases they can. So I think for traffic shaping cases, you could probably replace them. Uh, for delay emulation, you could probably replace them as well. The issue we had was that because we're looking at the performance of a transport protocol, uh, if we get a packet which has come through too quickly, then it will, uh, it will be an unfair experiment to run. And so from a scientific perspective, this wasn't allowed. Uh, so we had to use hardware to make sure we we're getting correct delay emulation, but um, you might not care. I mean, if you're running your web proxy and you just want to see how things work, it, you could still try it. It won't be as scientific and you might not be the same as a real use case, but it's definitely better than better than nothing. What's one feature you wish DummyNet had? I wish that DummyNet could have network rates described in mega and gigabits per second. Um, but when I have tried to use them recently, the client has given me bits per second instead. Uh, maybe Christoph has fixed this. That's not really a feature, that's a bug. Um, I'm actually quite happy with what DummyNet offers right now. Uh, it has been enough to build these experiments um i'm sure there is stuff available in tc and in, in linux and netm and linux that would be nice to have but it, it's it's not been ported yet i think we are lacking a lot of good examples of how to use dummy net i've definitely seen papers where people are trying to look at quick on satellite using netm and the networks they've built have not actually been accurate enough for some of their claims so it, it's hard I mean, this isn't an easy thing to do it's really difficult to test and verify these networks
the question at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that there was fear of quick being implemented in satellite networks because it would kill investments. What needs to be implemented in satellite does not OSI model apply here anymore. So the, the OSI model applies um, the the meddling that PEPs do with traffic make uh, the web much easier to use on a satellite network. Um, people are very fickle in their enjoyment of the internet and the delay you get on a normal network can be can actually be excruciating. Uh, if you're talking about the best case where there's no packet loss and nothing is going wrong, then it is not fun to use. If there is packet loss and things are being retransmitted a lot, it can be horrible to use. People are buying these, these services um, and if they don't like them, they might just not buy them. And the fact is that it is entirely possible that um, that another service maybe with less capacity can become available. So people might just install wireless links and point to point links um, that will serve them out in a field. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like a weird fear, but people are just scared of everything that's new. New is scary. Okay, are there any more questions? I don't I don't see anything else. Uh, thank you for for joining me today. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your BSD con. It's, it's, it's been great getting uh, most of a conference to happen. Uh, and I can't wait if we can do this again in person.